Thanks, Kelly. Um, since the pandemic, most local governments have probably been receiving a lot more federal funds. Uh, that means you're doing a lot more federal spending, and now you're hearing that you might need a single audit. Uh, for some entities, this might be the first time, and there's probably a lot of questions. Uh, so we're here to answer the questions on what is a single audit, uh, do you need one, and how can you be prepared? So a single audit is an audit required by the federal government. Uh, any entity that spends more than $750,000 in a single year is required by the federal government to get a single audit. Now this $750,000 is a cumulative total. So once you've spent over $750,000 on all of your grants in total, you'd be required to get a single audit. You don't need to meet that threshold for just one program. Uh, this threshold is not something that's created by the auditor's office, so we don't have flexibility to waive this audit requirement. Uh, you'll hear later today about the threshold needed to surpass in order to get an audit. Uh, it's important to note that this federal requirement supersedes the state law on when you need an audit. So if you don't have the $2 million in receipts, but you expend more than $750,000 in federal funds, you will still need to get a single audit. Um, and this single audit would be done at the same time that you're getting your financial statement audit. Um, now you're probably wondering what do you count towards your federal total? Um, that's anything that derived from the federal government. So whether you receive the money directly from the feds or you received it from another entity, whether it be a state entity, if you're the city and you're receiving funds from the county, if you're a water resource district and you receive the funds from someone else, all of those funds could be counted towards your federal total. So some examples of programs that you might be receiving that would count towards a $750,000 threshold is Impact Aid, Title I, ESSER, Disaster Grants, Medical Assistance, or Child Nutrition Cluster. Uh, this isn't an all-inclusive list. It's just some of the bigger, more common programs. So there could be other programs that you may be getting that would still be federally funded. Uh, there are also funding that doesn't count. So any funds that you receive from the state that are state funded programs, um, things like foundation aid. So for school districts, your per pupil payment that you get from the Department of Public Instruction, those are not federal funds. Um, some of the highway tax distribution dollars that come from the Department of Transportation, those are also state funds. So those don't count towards your total. Um, in 2021, we had a special special session and House Bill 1505 came out of that. That was the state's American Rescue Plan funding. None of the funds that any of the local governments received as a result of that bill should be counted towards federal funding. Those are not considered federal funds for the purpose of meeting the $750,000 threshold. There was also enhancements to at least one federal program by the state during this last session. Um, so the state enhanced the free and reduced meal program. So those thresholds that the federal government requires are now greater for this extended state portion. The Department of Public Instruction will identify the difference between what is federally funded and what is state funded. So the state expansion portion of this program does not count towards that $750,000 threshold. If you're not sure if your program is federally funded, um, I would make sure you can reach out to your auditor, the auditor's office, or any other private auditor that you may be using. They should be aware of different programs that are out there. I would also reach out to the awarding agency. So if you're getting money from the state on a different program, you can reach out to DPI, the DOT, or any other entity. If you're a city, reach out to your county. They know if the money they gave you is federal. Um, that should help you come up with your $750,000 total. So now you know what you need um, to meet the threshold to get a single audit. So what can you expect? So our auditors are going to be testing your federal programs based on what's called a compliance supplement. So the federal government issues a compliance supplement for many of the assistance listing numbers um, for funding that is provided. Not all, but many of them. So if an, a compliance supplement is available, the auditor will go through that program 
uh, that compliance supplement and identify what compliance requirements are considered direct to your program. The federal government will do what's called a pick six. If you've never heard of a pick six, they will typically pick six of the compliance, pro pro compliance requirements that they feel are related to your program. That means our auditors will go and evaluate those compliance requirements and determine whether your activity within that program was significant to the compliance requirement. So if you had material spending or material activity in that compliance requirement, then the auditor's office would, or your private auditor would look at that compliance requirement. So like I said, not all programs have compliance supplements, unfortunately. So if they don't have a compliance supplement, we would look at your grant agreement. So your grant agreement will have all of the federal compliance requirements that you need to be following as a recipient of those grant funds. Um, in that, we will identify those significant compliance requirements and follow the same process that we had previously for those with a compliance supplement and see if they are material to your program spending and that's how we'll determine our testing. Uh, unfortunately, those that don't have a compliance supplement, there is no pick six. So that means that you could potentially have to look at more than six compliance areas. Uh, but it is important for you guys to note that Regardless of whether we look at a grant agreement or a compliance supplement, that does not mean that you'd necessarily be looking at at least six compliance areas. We would only look at the ones that we determine to be material to your spending. Uh, one big area that we look at for the single audit is internal controls. So internal controls is a big auditor word, so some people may not be as familiar on what is internal controls. Really, the auditor is going to come in and ask what your procedures are related to those compliance areas. Um, and how do you know that you would detect something improper happen or prevent something improper from happening? So you can think of it as things like the approval of expenditures to make sure that they're for an allowable purpose. Um, looking at reviews of your reports to make sure they're accurate. If you've created some sort of checklist for an application process, those would all be internal controls that your auditor may be looking at. Um, and the unique area with the federal government and the single audit is the federal government requires the auditors to look at internal controls. So we are actually required to test internal controls related to your programs. Um, any of those direct and material compliance requirements that I just discussed that the auditor determined need to have testing would also need internal control testing. So what that means is if you don't have internal controls in place over those compliance areas, so if you don't have some sort of internal control related to making sure expenditures are spent on something that they should be, um, that could result in an audit finding. If you have weaknesses in those internal controls, that could result in an audit finding. So if these internal control issues are in multiple areas, that could mean that you would have multiple control findings throughout that program. The auditor will also be required to evaluate those findings to determine whether they meet the federal definition of what is a material weakness. Um, in that auditor term, if they meet that definition, the federal government requires us to modify our audit opinion in that area. So there isn't a lot of flexibility if you don't have controls in place and we're meeting those federal definitions, we have to modify our audit opinion in that area. The next area that we're gonna be looking at is compliance. So all of those same areas that we identified as um, direct and material that we're looking at controls, we're gonna be looking for compliance. So making sure that you did what was intended with that money. So the testing that we do is gonna vary. If we're gonna be looking at allowable costs, we're gonna be looking to make sure that what you spent was for the purpose of the program. It's for an allowable cost that is listed in your federal grant. If, when it comes to reporting, we're gonna make sure that you tested or that you provided the information um, timely based on what the reporting requirements are and that it actually um, is accurate based on what your records are. So that's gonna vary depending on what the compliance requirement is and be specific on um, what objective we're trying to achieve.
The other thing to consider is that the single audit has sample size requirements. So when the auditor comes in, if you feel like they're testing more than they should or that they're testing a lot, um, they're testing based on federal guidance. Regardless of whether um, they're testing internal controls or we're testing compliance, the federal government has provided thresholds of sample sizes. So I can give an example. Um, for a population size of 250 items. So if you had more than 250 expenditures in a single for a single program, we would have to evaluate the risk and determine uh, whether it was low, moderate, high, and whether we were going to be testing 25, 40, or 60. So those are the sample size requirements based on that population size. So when I talk about risk, that can be a broad term. Uh, so you might be wondering, what does that mean? If the auditor comes in, why are they testing 25 for me, but they tested 60 for somebody else? So risk is based on what your specific circumstances are. Did you have prior audit findings? Did the auditor come in and look and see that you don't have internal controls in place? Is it a new program? Um, what is the complexity of the area that we're looking at? Have you had turnover? Um, there's a multitude of different things, but that should help you drive that. So if you had findings and turnover and it's um, a pretty complex area, your risk is going to likely be higher, which is going to result in moving up sample size compared to an entity that their circumstances are different where they may not have findings and they've had consistent staff and they are aware of the program requirements. So that's just something to consider um, when you're understanding what we're looking at. Um, the same is in place for any population sizes that are less than 250. So if you submit a quarterly report um, and there's four of them, we would have to evaluate that risk again and then look at the federal guidelines for what the range that we can select our sample size from. So the federal government does require us to do that to be able to conclude that you've spent the money the way it's supposed to be and you're complying with the requirements of the program. So now that you know whether you would need a single audit and what to be prepared for, uh, I wanted to talk about what we're kind of finding. So one of the big areas that we're finding um, errors in is missing support. So the auditor is always going to say if there isn't any support, it didn't happen. You need to make sure that you're keeping all documentation you have to support that you complied with the requirements of the program. So the type of documentation is going to be different. Uh, if you made a purchase, uh, and that and the purchase was for something that is allowable, you may just need to keep an invoice. Uh, if part of your funds were going to be granted out and part of the determination of who was going to get the money and how much money they were getting was based on an application process, then you would need to keep all the documentation that you use to make sure that it was allowable to spend that money for that purpose. Uh, one unique area that you may not consider is when you're doing reporting. If your accounting system doesn't allow you to rerun reports for a specific time period to support the report that you sent to the federal government, you need to maintain that report. If the auditor can't come in and recreate it out of your system, they have no way to be able to support your report that was sent. So that could be a weakness for you. Uh, if you're not sure whether you should be keeping something, the odds are you should. <laughs> Typically not having documentation is the problem. Not having too much documentation has never been an issue for the auditors. Um, it just better supports your rationale and what you're using the money for. And uh, this has been a problem in the past. We, we've seen it on the state level where maybe you had to submit a report to the federal government by a certain date and the accounting system that you're submitting it to or the federal system doesn't maintain the date of submission you would want to keep record or document record of when you submitted that. So those are all just areas and ideas to consider when you're looking at your documentation retention processes. The other area we've had issues in is internal controls. Uh, we already discussed our requirement to test internal controls. So really it's internal controls not being in place. So there's no controls over compliance areas or finding inconsistencies and weaknesses on those internal controls. So that has been a consistent problem. Um, 
you need to just evaluate your processes over that grant. How are you making sure that something bad didn't happen or preventing it from happening? And there's a lot of different examples. Um, I think one good area is you're going to segregate who is the person that reviews and approves an expenditure and who's the person that actually pays it, right? Why do you do that? It's so that you have an independent review. You can make sure that those expenditures were for an allowable purpose before they go out the door. Um, suspension and debarment. Having a person that is looking to see whether vendors were all suspended and debarred that would make sure that you'd be complying with the suspension and debarment requirement since you cannot pay federal dollars to a suspended or debarred vendor. Um, like we've talked about in the past, if you aren't sure on internal controls, you can always reach out to the auditor. Um, part six of the OMB compliance supplement talks about internal controls. There's also the green book, which is the standards of internal control in the federal government that is free on the GAO website. And that talks about internal control framework. So if you're not sure how to develop processes or procedures, those are all resources that you can use when you're trying to make sure that you're complying with control processes for your grant programs. Uh, now I wanted to kind of discuss how to make sure that you're prepared. Um, first, make sure you're reading your grant agreements. Uh, everyone that's receiving federal funds should be reading their grant agreements to better understand what, what they've essentially signed on to, what you're saying you're going to be complying with with that federal funding. Um, that will help you understand what you're required to do. Uh, you can also take a look at the compliance supplement that the auditors are going to use. That's going to identify specific compliance requirements that we're going to be looking at, and it'll just help you um, give an overview of what's going to be required for that grant. Like I just said, make sure you're keeping all of your documents supporting how the money was spent. If you don't have receipts, it's going to be a question cost on whether you spent the money the way the grant wanted you to. Um, if you don't have copies to support your reports, then we're going to have to say reporting is wrong. If you do any sort of eligibility determinations and you're not keeping the records to support how somebody or something was eligible to receive the funding, um, that's also going to create a problem from the audit side that's going to result in findings in your report. Uh, so we talked about a lot of things related to the single audit, but ultimately everyone might be asking still, why do you care? Why do you care about the single audit and what does it mean for your entity? Um, essentially, when you sign your grant agreements, you are agreeing that you're going to receive a, a single audit from the federal requirements. Um, so that is the first part. The second part, um, which may be the most important to you, is you could have to give money back. So for any entity that's received a single audit, you might see that on audit findings, there's something called a question cost. Um, if you've never received a single audit, you would see in your upcoming reports, if there are errors or compliance issues, there might be a question cost. So the federal government requires the auditor to identify if there is a potential um, what appears to be misspending. So a cost that we know that you maybe did not spend in accordance with the federal government. They also require us to give a, a projection, a potential question cost. So if you misspent um, $500 based on how our sample is, we have to extrapolate that out based on your population and circumstances to say that $500 likely could be $500,000 and that all gets reported to the federal government. Now the federal government could come back and have you give funding back if you're having question costs. Uh, you're likely going to have to work with the feds on your findings. A lot of times your federal awarding agency is going to reach out on your audit findings. Um, they may request additional support. They may ask additional questions on your corrective action plan, um, and they could be looking at those question costs to determine whether they are going to sustain them, which means they agree that they were question costs. You spent the money and it shouldn't have been spent that way for the grant which then again means that they could come back and ask for you to pay for it back. So you would have to find other resources to give that federal funding back. And then finally, you could impact your future funding. 
So if you don't submit a single audit, the federal awarding agency or other agencies, if you're getting passed through dollars, could make the decision that you don't get that funding until after you submit your next single audit. So not submitting a single audit could have future impacts to you as well. Um, that concludes my part of the presentation. I'm gonna pass it on to Brent to talk more about disasters. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, a lot of you know who I am, uh, Brent Call, uh, Public Assistance Officer for the North Dakota Department of Emergency Services. And today we're gonna be talking about uh, FEMA compliance and record keeping. Um, for the, the the basis of this conversation, we're going to be talking about um, everything after obligation. So once your project has been reviewed, approved by FEMA, um, that's where we're going to kind of take off here. <clears throat> so the, the the four aspects or the four main requirements for FEMA um, that we're we'll going to be going over are the scope of work um, that does need to be completed as written uh, according to your project worksheet. Uh, you need to make sure you're uh, comp comp in compliance with the environmental, historic, and pre preservation requirements. Uh, FEMA and state funding is trackable, uh, as well as any procurement requirements uh, according to your project. So, uh, scope of work. Uh, every one of your projects is going to have a defined scope of work. Uh, we deal a lot with gravel roads, things like that. So, we're going to be kind of a, you know, keying this presentation to gravel roads. That's a majority of what we see with FEMA, things like that. Um, so if your site um, was awarded 20 cubic yards, for example, in, in, in um, your project worksheet, you're going to need to maintain your records um, that identify uh, 20 cubic yards were placed at your site. So that's either through in contractors invoices or your force account records. Um, the next thing that we talk about is the record of environmental consideration or the REC. Uh, this is where you're going to find all of your EHP requirements. Uh, the five big ones that we see with our typical gravel roads are material borrow compliances or SHPOs. Uh, so what that is, is any type of mined material that was used to repair your sites needs to come from a SHPO or NDDOT certified pit. Um, they can't just be digging that out of the ground. It has to come from a certified source. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers permit, USACE. What we look for in that is if you are in, near, or around water where work is taking place, you might want to contact your Army Corps of Engineer representative. That's where um, we're going to point out that permit as well. Floodplain permit, that is for um, any type of work that's uh, within a floodplain. Now that depends on which floodplain you are, how it's mapped, things like that. So you want to check with your local floodplain administrator to see if there's any permitting required with that. <clears throat> Disposal location. So we get a lot of this with culverts and bridges and debris. That makes a, a big chunk of our, our, our projects. Um, you can't store this stuff within a floodplain. That's the biggest aspect you have to remember with disposal locations. You want to make sure those are out of the floodplain, and FEMA needs to make sure that when you are disposing this stuff that it is out of the floodplain. So make sure you have your disposal locations to include GPSs and addresses. Uh, pollutant discharge permit, this is from the Department of Health. So if you are putting anything in a certain type of uh, uh, body of water, they usually define it as navigable bodies of water, um, you may need that pollutant discharge permit. Uh, these five cover a majority of what we're looking at, but you might want to look at your record of environmental consideration to find out specifically what you may or may not uh, be required to do. Uh, third thing we're going to talk about is transfer of funding. Uh, you need to make sure that your funding that you receive from the state as well as from the federal government is trackable. Uh, we'll need to see proof of payments from vendors. Um, you can use that as a, as a warrant or a canceled check. So um, that's going to be from a, a, a local entity, uh, not necessarily a county. When we talk about counties, it's a little bit different. Uh, counties are the spokesperson essentially for the townships here. So we ask that you keep track of your funding a little bit different or there's a few you know, different subtleties of the, the requirements for, for funding. Uh, 
What we're looking for there is townships are required to, to maintain their proof of payments to their vendors. However, you are not. Um, the county is required to maintain proof of payment to the township. So when the state releases that federal funding and that um, state funding to you as the county, you need to make sure that's trackable when you pay out your townships. Uh, very important bullet here, counties should not release FEMA funding or state funding to townships unless they have met the REC procurement and scope of work requirements. So unless they give you that invoice, you have it in hand, don't pay your townships because if they don't get you that information at a later date, you're going to be on the hook to pay that funding back. Uh, record retention. So this is our notification system that uh, uh, that notifies you that your PW has been officially obligated and where you can find that information. Uh, these three paragraphs don't need to read them, but this is an example of the email you're going to get from our office when your project worksheet has been officially obligated and you can go look at all that final documentation. Um, so this is the example when you follow that link. This is where it's going to take you to. Uh, in this case, this is project 212 version zero, and you're going to find all that support documentation uh, down by that little red arrow. Uh, you may have one tab, you may have 10 tabs, depending on how big that uh, project worksheet is. Uh, all the information that can be found right here has been compiled um, from all of the work you put in with your program delivery manager to create this file. So you would have seen most of this documentation that um, that's uploaded in here. You'll see your cost summary sheets, your damage photos, uh, anything that really was used to develop your final obligated project. So we're going to talk a little bit about scope of work. Um, every one of your projects is going to get one of these. We call them the cost summary sheet. So you'll get at least one of these per project. But ideally, um, you'll have one of these per damage inventory. In this case, damage inventory four, five, six. So we can have multiple damage inventories in a project but each one of these is specific to a township or a type of work. So we always break that out and you always get a copy of one of these. So this is where you're going to be able to find your scope of work, your damages and your cost. So again, this is specific to one project, even more specific to one damage inventory. Again, we work with a lot of gravel sites here and that's what we get, we're uh, kind of going over today. In this case, you're going to see your sites uh, listed on the left, one, two, three, four, five. You're going to see the amount of cubic yards for gravel that was awarded. Um, you're going to see the amount of cubic yards that was awarded for pit run and embankment and so on and so forth. Um, not only are you going to be able to see specifically what we're awarding to each one of these sites, we're going to give you a total at the end. Um, so you're going to be able to see that site one received three hundred thirty dollars and two six twenty five and so on and so forth. Um, so again, you're going to see that total back at the beginning. Each one of these damage inventories is going to be specific to a township or specific to an entity. So you're going to have that breakdown before we send this to FEMA for their first review. Now, uh, this is what, what the state creates. Uh, we submit this for FEMA for their approval. Sometimes this can change on the way down once it's reviewed, but typically this will stay constant. If there is a change, we'll let you know. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that. You have an opportunity to review it, not only before we send it to FEMA, but once it comes back. So these cost summary sheets are, are fluid, but for the most part, they're not going to change much between the first time you see them and the time of, of, of obligation. Uh, talking about the record of envir environmental consideration, uh, this is kind of a lengthy document that can be difficult to read. Um, we'll always help you interpret these, but Every one of your projects will receive one of these, and this is the title of that document. They can range from anywhere between three pages and seven pages, depending on the length and the um, particulars of that project. But this is where you're going to find that stuff um, on this document. Uh, it's usually down at the bottom of the page or the last page under standard conditions, where you're going to find uh, the SHPO compliance review, the, the core review, and it's going to tell you what you need for these, uh, these, this particular project. Uh, we're going to define a little bit of small project and large projects. Um, the state is going to define a small project as anything between uh, or below $199,999 and below. Uh, these projects will pay, be paid to you um, once it's funded. So to, to, regardless if the work is done or work to be completed, this will be paid to you up front. 
Uh, again, you're going to receive a new email notification that lets you know that this project has been obligated and the funding is available. Uh, we'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, of federal funding is released to the state or us, the recipient. Uh, the email will follow when the funding has been transferred to your account. The received, recipient then forwards the federal and state funding to the applicant at the uh, account that you choose. So we'll, we'll go over that with you prior uh, to releasing any funding and you'll uh, have that waiting in your account when the, the funding is available. Funding must be placed in a non-interest bearing account. Uh, we highly recommend to keep this funding in its own account. I know some folks uh, mix those in with other accounts and they and they have numbers to track them, but we encourage you to keep it in its own account. Again, funding must be trackable. And this is an example of that email you're going to receive. Uh, once that funding is made available, uh, go ahead and follow the link. And then again, uh, it'll take you to the payable for that project worksheet, and you're going to see that invoice where that that red uh, arrow is down there. So uh, we transfer everything electronically now. We don't do this in paper anymore, so you will receive one of these for every one of your project worksheets as well. Uh, talk about large projects. Uh, large projects are typically anything over a million dollars, but the state has an obligation to keep track of these fundings, make sure procurement is followed. And, and we, we chose $200,000 because of the state procurement policy. Uh, so anything above $200,000 when it comes to a single work to be completed site, um, we're going to classify this as a large project and we're going to put those um, uh, practices in that we need to follow for any other large project closeout. Uh, so no federal or state funding is paid on obligation for any single site over $200,000 as work to be completed. Federal funding can be placed or federal funding can be paid once NDDES has completed the large project closeout review. Uh, the state share funding can be paid once the FEMA review has been uh, completed as well. The FEMA review can take some time, as some of you know. Uh, currently, we have some projects sitting down there that are well over a year long, so that state share funding can take some time before it gets to you. A portion of your federal funding can be paid to you in advance if you can meet the following requirements, the procurement, uh, the EHP requirements, scope of work, proof of payment, and um, these requests must go through our, our website, Civics. So if you do have a portion of your project completed, let's say you placed uh, $100,000 of your, your, your $200,000 site, we can release 75%, uh, excuse me, 90% of the federal share to you in advance if you meet those requirements. Uh, we will need proof of payment per pay, uh, per pay application. So if you have more than one, we're going to need to see the proof of payment for at least one of those before we can release the second one. Uh, Noncompliance with large project closeout guidelines may result in a de-obligation of funding. Uh, procurement, uh, last thing we're going to be talking about, applicants must comply with federal procurement standards as a condition to receiving the PA funding. Uh, must comply with the most stringent policy between the federal, state, and local uh, procurement procedures. So FEMA will be asking for your, your local procurement policy, and if it's more stringent than the state or the federal policy, that's the one that you're going to have to follow. Applicants are responsible for establishing, establishing reasonable costs at all times. Now, that's for any project below 200000 as well. So if you have a project for $10,000, we expect you guys to see quotes, establish local market costs, or establish in-place costs through um, our, our material cost sheet. I know a lot of you guys are familiar with that. Uh, FEMA Procurement Disaster Team Field Manual can be found under the grants and the Grants DESND.gov website. Uh, we also have the public assistance policy uh, from FEMA, where you can find that section under uh, pages 77 through 85. It is a lengthy procurement policy. Uh, if you do have time, please read that. These are our state standards. So uh, that, this is why we chose that $200,000 threshold. Uh, if you do have a single site or to be completed uh, project, you must advertise uh, three consecutive weeks for at least 21 days before bid opening. And that's why we put that on there. We need to make sure we're, we're bidding these properly. Um, we recommend that you bid all projects 
uh, or excuse me, seal bid all of your projects as well. Large projects, excuse me. Uh, this is the procurement uh, standards for state purchases as well. I won't go through those, but it's just an example. If you are um, making any purchases for material or anything like that, those are the requirements that you're going to need to, to go over. Uh, we do have a lot of training material. I wish the, the FEMA program was a little bit more simpler than it was, but the program can cover a million dollar disaster up to a disaster in the billions. So it is big, it is massive, um, lots of material, um, but we have compiled quite a bit of good training stuff or training material for you guys. You can find that in that link. Uh, that'll take you to our civics uh, a page or our desnd.gov grants page. The applicant PA training video, uh, we did that last year. Uh, that's going to go cover every kind of uh, question you may have for public assistance. We have the township handout. Uh, we encourage you guys to get those out to your townships as soon as you can. Uh, the recovery transition meeting applicant handout, that's for uh, once we have wrapped up and obligated all of your projects. That's a 20 page document that'll help you kind of um, track and, and, and manage your grant for that uh, specific disaster. Large project closeout handouts, um, documentation preparation training video that we just recorded a few months ago, and it kind of goes on and on. But these are the ones that I, I can see when you're when you're dealing with a FEMA grant that are very important to, to kind of go over it and, and go through. Um, I'm sorry I, I failed to put my name and my number up there, but a lot of you guys know how to get in touch with me. i um, spoken with you quite a few already, so if you do have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Brent. We do have a question here. I believe that'll be most applicable to Lindsay. OK, so this question is asking about House Bill 1505 and if that money is considered to be federal dollars. Uh, I would have to double check. Is OK. Emily, can you look at my slide? Was it 1505 or 1508 that I was referring to? Yeah, so yeah, I can get back to them. Yeah, we'll look into that one and get back to you at the Q&A session with the direct answer for that question. And any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Thank you, Brent and Lindsay.